Madam President. Senator from Louisiana. Madam President, with me today is uh, one of my colleagues from my office, Mr. Blaine Callis. Madam President, the words of Dr. King, letter from a Birmingham jail, April 16, 1963. My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all of the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of a day. And I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I will try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should indicate why I am here in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the view which argues against outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliated organizations across the South, and one of them is the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Frequently, we share staff, educational, and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, the affiliate here in Birmingham asked us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented. And when the hour came, we lived up to our promise. So I, along with several members of my staff, am here because I was invited here. I am here because I have organizational ties here. But more basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century B.C. left their villages and carried their thus saith the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my hometown. Like Paul, like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with a narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea? Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. Now, you deplore 
the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham. But your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. I am sure that none of you would want to rest content with the superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. It is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham. But it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the African-American community with no alternative. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices exist. Negotiation. Self-purification and direct action. We have gone through all these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gainsaying the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of brutality is widely known. African Americans have experienced grossly unjust treatment in the courts. There have been more unsolved bombings of African American homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in the nation. These are the hard, brutal, facts of the case. On the basis of these conditions, African-American leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the latter consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. Then, last September, came the opportunity to talk with leaders of the Birmingham's economic community. In the course of the negotiations, Certain promises were made by the merchants. For example, to remove the store's humiliating racial signs. On the basis of these promises, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to a moratorium on all demonstrations. As the weeks and months went by, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. A few signs, a few signs briefly removed, returned. The others remained. As in so many past experiences, our hopes had been blasted, and the shadow of deep disappointment settled upon us. We had no alternative except to prepare for direct action whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and the national community. Mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. We began a series of workshops on nonviolence, and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept the blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? We decided to schedule our direct action program for the Easter season, realizing that except for Christmas, this is the main shopping period of the year. Knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action, we felt that this would be the best time to bring pressure to bear on the merchants for the needed change. Then it occurred to us that Birmingham's mayoral election was coming up in March, and we speedily decided to postpone action until action after Election Day. When we discovered that the Commissioner of Public Safety, Eugene Bull Connor, had piled up enough votes to be in the runoff, we decided again to postpone action 
until the day after the runoff so that the demonstrations could not be used to cloud the issues. Like many others, we waited to see Mr. Connor defeated. And to this end, we endured postponement after postponement. Having aided in this community need, we felt our direct action could be delayed no longer. The words of Dr. King, a letter from a Birmingham jail, April 16, 1963. Madam President, I yield the floor.